Right then, let's start in time. Good morning. Docker, right? So, um, who of you has yet to use Docker in some way? Okay. Who's, who's in a kind of uh, trial phase with Docker? Who's using Docker on a regular basis? Okay. So, um, who's not familiar with Docker at all? Okay. So, I'll just go a little bit into the basics, but not too much. So, Docker is a way of deploying your software, right? Um, and if you know what a virtual machine is, you know what Docker is not. Because Docker is much more like a software package, the things we have been installing on our Linux distributions for, for decades now, not only with an additional kind of runtime aspect to it. So, what some people do is deploy Docker containers with all the software that an application needs. They, for example, a hypothetical Drupal container would contain the PHP files of Drupal, the web server, the database, and other things that are necessary to run that, just like we did with the virtual machines all the time. But if you run Docker in that way, you're doing it wrong. These single container things aren't the way Docker is supposed to run. Um, Docker is built for a single application. So in the Drupal scenario, you would have a uh, web server container connected to a database container um, and uh, maybe additional containers around that. And these containers would interact and um, in the end deliver the Drupal website. Let's see if this clicker still works. Yes, it does. Just had to wake up. Um, so what Docker um, does is uh, it's a runtime that can download and start a container image containing the software you'd like to run and then um, give you tools to interconnect containers together to build your application stack. Now, my talk will be about orchestrating Docker, running multiple containers. Why would we need that? Well, with Docker, there is never one single container. Um, it's always things that uh, work together, two containers, 20, 200. And um, as soon as you get into these um, multitudes, um, you need some kind of tool that will help you um, manage all these containers and what you get from bare Docker, what you can download from, from docker.io, uh, won't help you anymore. Um, in an infrastructure, especially in a production infrastructure, you have containers popping up everywhere, containers going down, um, having to be replaced, and uh, for that you need some kind of tool that can keep an eye on your containers and say, okay, um, one of my three web server containers just went down for some reason, so I need to spin up um, another container somewhere to uh, mitigate that. And uh, that's what orchestration software does. Scheduling means picking the 
right host for each container. So for example, you might want to run your database containers on a machine that has SSD drives, is very powerful, has lots of RAM. Um, on the other hand, um, maybe you'd like to run a file storage container um, on a machine that has lots of uh, disk space, which would be too expensive built on SSDs. Um, and you want to have that automated, so you can say, okay, spin me up a new database container, and the orchestration software already knows, okay, for database containers, I'll have to pick a machine that has SSD drives, or that has at least five gigabytes of RAM available, or something like that. And then you have all these dependencies that I mentioned um, with your web server container running your Drupal, um, being able to talk to a database container, being able to talk to a memcache container or a Redis container. So these links need to be established between containers and for that to happen, my web server container needs to find out where its database is. And since we are constantly spinning up and, and, and spinning down containers, um, that might change. So my database container might have run uh, on one host yesterday, but on a different host today. And uh, that has to be visible um, to my web server container. There's also the issue of shared secrets. So my database container needs to provide a database for Drupal. For that, it needs a username and a password. The database needs to be cre created on the database container and uh, the user account needs to be created there too. But my web server container that runs Drupal needs to have these credentials too. That's all easy as long as you run Docker on a single machine, for example, on your laptop. Because everything is local. Um, it's clear that, um, for example, web server and database run on the same machine, and uh, even the basic Docker tooling gives you uh, um, things that you can use to, to link and connect, connect these containers. And you simply use environment variables to um, give things like uh, secrets to a container, and you simply use the same variable for the database container uh, as you use it for the web server container. So locally, uh, that's not much of a problem. And with Docker Compose, things got even more uh, simple because uh, doc what Docker Compose does on top of basic Docker is you will simply write a YAML file that contains all this information. So spin me up a Drupal container, spin me up a MySQL container, and please use the same password for both. As soon as you start running Docker on multiple machines, things get complicated. That's where Docker Compose can't help you anymore. And that's where um, orchestration tools like Container, which I'll be uh, um, talking about, will help you. Container says of themselves, container is an open source container platform built to maximize developer happiness. Works on any cloud, easy to set up, simple to use. And um, that's true. Container is simple, it's inexpensive, it's full featured, it's production ready, it's secure and it's quite flexible. And that's why I think it's the ideal tool to start running Docker on multiple machines. There are other competitors, well-known competitors like Kubernetes from Google or um, Mesos, for example. But these are huge things, and that's a bit like 
Well, if I'd like to start, say, baking, and um, I'm looking up a cupcake recipe, um, I don't expect the recipe to start with, first, let's build an oven. Because that oven will enable you to bake 300 cupcakes a day. Well, I only have two children. So um, these bigger orchestration platforms are great if you are running at the scale of Google. But if you just want to start and go beyond what the basic Docker binary gives you, um, uh, I, I think they are a bit um, over-engineered. Container is exactly the thing in the middle. And the cool thing is investing time here isn't uh, lost because the magic sauce is in your Docker images, how they are built, how they are enabled to interact and all these things. And you will, you will be able to run the same images on Kubernetes uh, later um, uh, as you are running them on container today. Container is easy to uh, install. It will take you, say, 20 minutes to spin up a basic uh, container cluster for the first time if you're using a cloud platform like Azure. And I'll demonstrate that later. It comes with everything that you uh, uh, need to start. And if you are already familiar, for example, with Docker Compose, you can um, use the same files and simply add a few uh, container-specific things, and you'll be able to run on multiple hosts. As open source software, uh, container is very inexpensive. And uh, for example, it also supports Let's Encrypt, so uh, even uh, securing your website with SSL will cost you nothing. It has everything that you need to get started. You have, you'll have a private image registry, so you can store your own Docker images locally on the platform. It comes with a load balancer that couldn't be easier to use. Um, it supports what's called service discovery, which means as soon as I spin up, say, a memcache container somewhere, this central registry has this information, and for example, my, my Docker, con uh, my Drupal container will get this information, and I could add it on the fly. It also has a secrets storage where you can store all your passwords and things like that at a central place and simply say, okay, here, my SQL container, use this password for the database Drupal. And I, I'll tell my Drupal container, well, dear Drupal container, use the exact same password. And even if that password changes, since both containers are referencing the same secret, um, there's never a disparity. And the same mechanism that does the service discovery can also act as a key value store where you can store arbitrary data um, from one container and make it available to others. You can also use container in production as we do. Um, it has user authentication and roles that let you express who has access to what. It offers you help checks beyond is this container running or not. So for example, for a web server container, you can define a HTTP help check that can actually check is not only if the container is running, but also if the website is actually reachable. And these health checks will be used both by the scheduling part that decides if it needs to spin up a container, and the load balancer that has to decide, am I allowed to direct traffic to that container? It supports stateful applications. For example, MySQL needs to store its, its data somewhere, and it doesn't make much sense to um, start another MySQL container somewhere else if the original one goes down because it won't have the data. So container knows, okay, there is a stateful container 
and uh, we can only spin that up where the data has been stored initially. The Drupal container, for example, won't be stateful in, uh, uh, in the best case, so we can spin that up um, at any place we like, as soon as we have a shared storage somewhere. It also does logging and gives you statistics, and it even has an audit trail that you can see who started a container where and what happened when something went wrong. It's also secure. Containers always run in what's called a grid. I come to that later. And these grids are virtual networks with their own private IP addresses. And um, they are connected by basically VPN connections that are encrypted. So um, that's quite secure. And um, with a simple um, open VPN client, you can connect to these grids to access, say, the private image registry, but without these credentials, no one will be able to talk to these containers. Except, of course, if you expose them to the public, which you would do with your Drupal container, which you probably won't do with your MySQL container. Container, container is also um, quite flexible in terms of where you install it. My demo will use DigitalOcean, but you can spin up container on Amazon, on Google, Microsoft. You can install it on your own machines using simply their uh, Ubuntu packages. So um, you can do even hybrid things like uh, running half of your infrastructure on Amazon on, and the other half on DigitalOcean, if you like, or on-premise. So just a few words about me. My name is Jochen. I'm the founder and CTO and CEO at Fryseed IT. We started in 2010, specializing in Drupal hosting. In 2013, we added WordPress. And our hosting platform is called Fryseed Box. Fryseed is, is the German word for freestyle, but is pronounced exactly the other way around. Um, and for those that can't remember that, um, we've recently added another domain. So you can simply add it, uh, enter hostng.co in your browser and you'll land on our website as well. Now let's get into how to use container. The architecture is very simple. You have a central container server that manages everything. And then you will have uh, grids of container nodes. And uh, each of these nodes will run an agent software that talks to the server, um, which is quite convenient because since the agent connects to the server and um, keeps that connection open, you don't have to have um, uh, open firewall ports for your nodes. Um, you'll simply have to uh, be able to connect to the server. Access to the container server, to the central part, is managed via OAuth. Um, you can use either the container cloud that is run by uh, the um, company that, that develops container. Um, container cloud is basically only an OAuth provider that you can use to, to um, log in on the web. And it will um, pass the, the OAuth tokens to your um, container master server. Uh, that's all the container cloud does at the moment. They are in, in, in the process of extending that. And uh, alternatively, you can use external OAuth providers that you um, uh, run yourself. Creating your container server, which you only have to do once, is easy with uh, the container command line tool. Um, you'll simply tell container, okay, um, I'd like to use the DigitalOcean plugin to spin up a master server. I'll name it container DCL or Duplicant London. Use my DigitalOcean API token. I'll choose the uh, DigitalOcean region London 1 with my SSH key, the droplet 
should have the one gigabyte size and use the container cloud for authentication. And it'll take about, say, five minutes for spinning up a droplet uh, at uh, DigitalOcean, installing the master server, and after that, you have your central piece. That's all there is. In this process, a first grid will be created named test automatically, and you can start as many grids as you like. Um, grids are simply groups of container nodes, which, which we'll now have to create. They use an overlay network, a virtual network, with its own IP addresses for the containers to communicate. And, of course, if you expose certain services to the public via a well-known port, uh, they'll use the public IP address of the host. And if you need to talk directly to the nodes, you'll have uh, access via VPN. You can simply um, run the command container VPN config, I think, and it'll, it'll write out an open VPN configuration file that you can import and, and you're good to go. That's how you create another grid. And from that point on, um, all the container commands will act on this grid. So I say, okay, I'd like to start a grid. I'll start with two nodes. I can add more later. And I uh, name this grid Drupal grid. Now for the nodes. These nodes are discovered automatically as soon as you add a new node it'll connect to the master server so uh, it becomes available and the master server will start using it. And that's how you spin up a new node, quite similar to the master server. Um, you create that, you'll, you'll have to use your DigitalOcean API token again, provide your SSH key and the DigitalOcean details here. I've already done that. Let's see. <coughs> if we are still ready to go. So there's two nodes, both running on DigitalOcean, and I've called them container demo node one and container demo node two. Now let's get cooking. Container services. A service is basically a container um, that you'd like to spin up. So you have to define the image that should be used. For example, I um, demo a, an Nginx server. You'll have to define if there are volumes, uh, so file storage directories that this uh, container should expose. You can define the resources. It, it gets, um, namely CPU shares and memory. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to limit that, it'll just use what's there. Um, you need to define if it's linked to any other container. So are there containers I need to talk to? You define the environment variables that will be used inside the container. Um, you can provide secret, secrets also as environment variables. Um, and as soon as a service is deployed, so run, um, it will automatically register with the master server and everyone who wants to know uh, will learn that this service has become available. So I just mentioned deployment. You can also define for each service the deployment strategy. Normally, container simply takes a container and runs it any, uh, wherever it, it, it likes. But you can also say, I'd like to run this container next to another. So for example, um, if I have two containers that share data volumes, they need to run on the same machine. Um, and uh, that will be deployed accordingly. You can also do something what's called daemon deployment, uh, which means this container will be run on every node. So for example, if you have a monitoring service that needs to uh, check all your container 
containers, you, you'd like to run that on every node, of course. So every of your containers coming up anywhere will be monitored, and you'd probably run that um, in daemon mode. You'll also define the number of instances. For example, if you are in a uh, redundant setup, you'd probably would want to run your Drupal web servers uh, in more than one instance. And what's quite uh, nifty is you can define a port to wait for. So, um, for example, for a web server, you can tell container, please wait until port 80 is actually reachable. Um, so, for example, if I do an a image update, I have a new Drupal image that I'd like to deploy. So every container needs to be stopped and restarted with a new version of the image. Container will actually stop your first Drupal instance, spin it up with a new instance, wait until its port 80 is actually available, and only then go to the next Drupal container and destroy that and rebuild it. So um, you'll have zero downtime. And that's how you start such a service. You simply say, okay, I'd like to use the Nginx, uh, in, uh, Nginx image in the latest version to run a container named Nginx and please expose port 80 to the public. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I've already prepared something. So now, I've started my Nginx service. No, I, I haven't started it, I have defined it. So I've defined the Nginx um, service, and as you can see, uh, there are zero instances of that at the moment. Let's change that by using the deploy command. Now it will actually spin up uh, Nginx on one of our nodes. It might have to download the latest Nginx image. So I've already run that, but um, if there had been a, an, an update of the, this image, uh, it, it uh, had to download it first. So let's see. Um, it ran uh, the command container service show nginx, which shows me the details of this service. And I get all the things that have been um, defined by default because I didn't um, mention them in, in the uh, service definition. So it will only um, run this one instance, scaling one. It will automatically choose the HA strategy. Um, it will export, uh, uh, expose port 80. And we have one instance of Nginx running. This is the private IP that uh, Container always uses. Usually it uses the 1081 network. Since they're all disparate, you can use the same addresses in every build. Um, and the node that the container is running on has the public IP 46 and so on. So on this, um, on this node, I should be able to access Nginx here. The Wi-Fi would hold up. Let's see. Mm. Should automatically reconnect. Let's split the time. Any questions so far? So, that's the public IP. 
I've just grabbed that out of the service show uh, output and uh, if I use that IP 46.101.6.139 I'll get the default page that Nginx is delivering. You could even try that on your own web browser. So that's how easy it is to spin up a container without uh, having to do much. And that's what I mean with container is really simple. No plus and um, you'll just have to have an image which I've taken from the public uh, Docker library and uh, things are running already. <coughs> That's how you create a stateful service. So for example, if I want to run Redis which uh, stores files on the machine, I'll better uh, define that as stateful so that I don't lose all my Redis data any time uh, the container is spun up somewhere else. And um, you'll simply add the option dash dash stateful. And I don't expose any port here. Um, that happens automatically if the image provides that port. And um, I can actually access that server right away because each grid has its own internal domain name and um, the, con the service name is just prepended to that. So I, can, uh, for, I could, for example, talk to this container using the name redis.drupalgrid.container.io, I think. Um, so it's just composed out of the service name, the grid name, and uh, the uh, top-level domain container.io. And uh, these names are all grid local, so they can't interfere with each other. With each other. And that's how you scale up a service. So um, I've spun up the service on a single container. Um, and uh, I can simply issue a container scale command. Now I'm scaling it to, to two um, instances, so it will have to spin up another instance additionally to the one I'm already running. And if I then uh, issue the container service show for Nginx, I'll see that I have two instances. Running on different nodes. So if we compare the public IPs, these services are actually running on different nodes. That's that. Now, let's get, let's do another step. Um, single services are fine, but for example, to run Drupal, we need a lot of these. We need the Drupal service, also the PHP part. Uh, we need MySQL, and we might need additional things. So that's where container stacks come in, which are basically combinations of services. And that's well, what I uh, mentioned earlier. If you are already familiar with Docker Compose, that's what Docker Compose does locally on your machine, where you can say, okay, I'd like to spin up a Drupal container and a MySQL container, and they need to talk to each other. In the multi-node setup, container does exactly the same without you having to do anything extra. Services are defined by a YAML file, like with Docker Compose. They use their own DNS domain, which is now uh, stack.grid.container.io, and um, the services get prepended to that. Um, and stacks are versioned, so you can update your uh, service definition um, and even store that in a central registry and um, use um, certain versions that you defined. It's also quite easy to, to install a stack. I'll here I simply define a stack named Drupal from a YAML file. Let's take a look at how that looks. <coughs> um, it starts with the name of the stack and the version. And then I start to define variables that I'll have to use later. For example, I need the MySQL password at several places and I'll simply define my passwords here. What we're doing here is 
defining a variable named Google My Simple Rules, which is a string. And for each variable, I can define both where its value comes from and where the value goes. What I do here is offering two alternative sources. So first step would be to take a look at the container vault where the secrets are stored and look for a key named Google My SQL Rules. And if you don't find anything here, because we've never spun up this stack, then simply, oops, simply create a random string of 32 characters. And wherever you got that value from, store it in the vault under the name Google My SQL Rules. And we'll do the same for the database password that Google will be using. We'll first need the root password to create the database, and then we'll um, create a user using this MySQL password to access the database. And then we'll simply define the services. So first, here's the Drupal service. I'll define which image I'd like to run. Drupal stores files, so it has to be stateful. It will expose port 80. I'm defining a simple environment variable MySQL user named Drupal. That's what the container image will be using to access the database. Um, and I use the Drupal MySQL password I've defined before and assign it to an environment variable named MySQL password, which will be used by the container as well. The container by default uses the host name MySQL for the database. And I don't have to do anything about that because since my database service, as you'll soon see, is named MySQL, that host name becomes available automatically. And then I'll define a few volumes because I'd like to have these directories um, stored outside of the container. So uh, they don't uh, vanish with when, when the container is destroyed, for example. And as mentioned, here's the second service, MySQL. Um, it needs to be stateful too. I'm defining two environment variables here, Drupal as the database name and Drupal as the user. So the container image will automatically create a database named Drupal. And it'll grant access to the user Drupal. And it'll use the same secret Drupal MySQL root to create the database. And then it'll use the secret Drupal MySQL password to grant access to the database. So let's see how that works. Let's remove the Nginx service first, and then deploy the Drupal stack. First, it's deploying a service Drupal LB, which is the load balancer. I'll come to that in a moment. Oops. Seems to be taking a bit of time. Now it spins up the MySQL service. These are all dependencies of the Drupal service, so th they get deployed first. And now, finally, Drupal, which is the web server part, is deployed as well. So now we have three services interacting each with each other. <coughs> now let's get to the load balancer part first, I'll, I'll come back to this. Load balancing normally is quite a complex thing because you have to spin up a load balancing service which needs to know all the backend nodes and uh, how it's going to distribute requests between these nodes and stuff and container takes all of that away. That's all you have to do 
to add load balancing to our previous stack definition. We will add a new service called Duplan B using the uh, LB image provided by container and expose its port 80. That's not exposed by Drupal anymore. And then you say, okay, I'd like two instances of my Drupal container, and I define four additional environment variables that define how the um, load balancer should behave. And simply by linking my Drupal container to the Drupal LB container, the Drupal LB image knows where its backends are and it configured itself automatically. And if I add another Drupal instance, the load balancer will again automatically um, change its configuration to um, distribute between the three services. It couldn't be simpler. So let's see how that works. Our stack has been deployed and installed. So if I list my services now, the Nginx service has gone and we have a Drupal service running on two instances. I have a MySQL uh, service running on one instance and I have the load balancer running in two instances as well. And if I grab the service um, details of my Drupal service, I get the two um, IP addresses of my nodes. There are only two nodes, so uh, there's not much choice there. And if you try to access these, one of these IP addresses, you'll, you'll uh, see a newly installed Drupal 8.2. We can, we can try and copy that. Has any one of you the IP on, on, on his machine here? Let's see. Do this starting up. Is that correct, you think? Here we go. Copy. Here we go. Wasn't that easy? Two node Drupal cluster. And I, I, I didn't do anything extra that you didn't see. The only thing I actually did in front of the uh, talk was spinning up the, the master and the two nodes because that takes about five or, or seven minutes. And adding SSL <coughs> to that, which I haven't done um, is easy as well. You simply need to register your email address with let's encrypt. You request a certificate for say www.example.com. You'll uh, receive a DNS uh, entry that you have to enter in the DNS of your domain, in that case example.com. Um, that authorizes you, um, or authorizes Let's Encrypt to issue uh, you a certificate for that domain. And then you simply say container certificate get www.example.com. It'll get the certificate from Let's Encrypt, store it in the container vault. And then you simply add uh, one, two, three, four, five, six lines to your load balancer configuration to use this certificate um, and switch from port 80 to port 443 and that's it. So in summary, container really is simple. It is easy to install and it's a really ideal next step after you've done your first uh, 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 steps with, with Docker at all. It's inexpensive, you can test it any time you like. It has 
all the features you'll, you'll need for the coming weeks and months. It's ready for production, it's secure, it's very flexible in terms of where you set it up, and it's really worth a try. Thanks. Um, container actually doesn't yet offer persistent storage for containers in the uh, sense that you can store data and that data uh, follows the container around. That's why you need these stateful services to make sure once you've uh, uh, stored some data on one of the nodes, the container will be spun up there at, uh, at always, every time. Um, there are services that uh, can do that, but they are much more complex. Um, and uh, there are things you can work around that. For example, um, I cheated in a way because I, while I've spun up two Drupal containers, if one of these containers would store something in, in uh, sites default files, it would only be on that node, and the other node wouldn't see any of these files. Um, the, I guess one of the most simple um, workarounds here would be to add a BitTorrent service that will simply share a volume with your Drupal container and uh, sync this volume uh, in, in uh, a local BitTorrent uh, uh, network. So by spinning up a BitTorrent container with every Drupal container um, and having these uh, BitTorrent nodes talk to each other, um, files that would be written by one container would automatically be uh, synced with the other containers. Of course, there are more complex solutions as well, like shared uh, file storages and things like that, but uh, I find the, the BitTorrent idea uh, quite, quite uh, appealing. And it's fast as well, so you, you could use that, actually. Um, what's the high availability of running the command chain? For example, on the domain of single market, you're controlling everything that goes away to this, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you're right. In, in this configuration, I only have one master. And if that goes down, um, I can't spin up new services or new nodes and things like that, so I'd be uh, impaired. Um, the ma what the master doesn't do is, for example, doing the service discovery. For that, uh, container um, installs an etcd instance in every grid, um, and as long as that runs, your service discovery will work fine and your PWM will store as well. Um, um, the container master has uh, quite a, a simple setup. It's the master software, which is a container by itself, and uh, it uses MongoDB as its uh, um, persistent storage. Um, and container has a, a short documentation document that explains how to make that highly available. You simply have to have a MongoDB cluster and uh, multiple instances of the uh, master application. Other questions? Um, how do you, uh, is there a way to also scale uh, instances for a node? Auto scale? Based on what? Based on nodes, CPU nodes. Like it's, it's a widely used. I know what you mean. Well, the, the simple answer uh, would be if you'd like to rebuild Amazon, I wouldn't use Container. Um, so uh, Container doesn't offer anything like that out of the box. Um, you could 
get creative again and uh, think of something that simply would uh, issue container node or container, uh, container scale uh, commands based on, uh, say, incoming requests, number of uh, Apache workers or um, any other metric. Um, but it doesn't offer anything out of the box for that because um, things get quite complex when, when you go that route. especially if you don't want to pre-deploy nodes. Simply issuing a scale command, like I did with Nginx earlier, uh, wouldn't be much of a problem. But if you'd like to say, OK, I only have two nodes now, but I need to scale up to five nodes so I can uh, reasonably spin up five Drupal containers, um, uh, that would uh, uh, need quite, quite a bit of orchestration as well. Because what happens if a node doesn't come up? What happens if the service on the node doesn't come up and all these things? And Amazon um, invested quite a bit of uh, engineering time into that problem. Um, and you'd have to have two. So if you uh, have problems in that uh, region, maybe you should try uh, get, getting started with a container and then move on to something like Kubernetes, for example. Anything else? Thanks for coming then. <laughs>